Good evening, church family. To all of our guests, you're our honored guest tonight. We're so glad to have you with us. I deeply appreciate your kind comments about the lesson this morning. And I had actually two different individuals this morning tell me about how they enjoyed the service, they appreciated this congregation, and uh, it's just wonderful to hear. It was the reason why almost eight years ago when uh, Jerry Moxley called me on the phone and said, Myrtle Beach is looking for a preacher. Are you interested? And I said, yes. Because I've been here from 91 and 95, and, and all the churches I've been a part of, this has always had a special place in our hearts. And we really appreciate this church family. And over the years, we deeply appreciate the strong leadership that's been here to, to keep us on the right path. Tonight, we're going to talk about that. Because as we're working through the book of First Peter, we're in chapter 2 tonight. And so right now, I'm going to ask you, uh, Eddie Smith did a wonderful blessing for me in recovering my Bible. And not just one, but i got two ribbons in my Bible. Now, if you have two like I do, you can do this. If you don't, you might want to put a, one of the cards there in, the foyer, uh, in front of you, put it in Jude, the book of Jude, and the other one in 2 Peter chapter 2. Because these two chapters really serve as divine commentaries on each other on the same subject of false teachers. This congregation is just ripe for a false teacher because we're so open, we're so loving. We need to be very careful of this. And we need to study this very carefully tonight. If I were to ask you, how does God feel about false teachers? Let us think for a minute with me. God who made us in his own image wants all of us to go to heaven. When we sin, he sent Jesus to save us. He gave us the Bible. And, and then have people take the Bible and twist it, false doctrine, and cause people to lose their soul. How do you think God feels about that? Well, how do you think that God's people should feel about false doctrine itself? Well, we're not really talking about feelings tonight because they're fickle. We're talking about facts. What does God's Word say about false teachers and false teaching? The first thing is the cause. The cause is itself a battle. That's why I ask you to mark Jude. We'll start with Jude tonight. Look at Jude beginning at verse 1. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ. We saw this morning that in the book of James, James calls himself a servant. Now, both James and Jude were half-brothers of Jesus. And yet they realize more important than being blood kin is being spiritually blood kin and to be a servant of the Christ. The brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God, set apart by God, 1 Peter chapter 1 talks about this as well, and Ephesians 1 as well, that when we are baptized, he sets us apart. We have a divine nature. We're sanctified, set apart. And also preserved or kept by Jesus and called. As he ends this book tonight, we're going to see, he talks about this again, how we are sanctified, we are kept, and we are called. Mercy unto you, in peace and love be multiplied. Just the way Peter starts his letters. But second. Peter, I mean, Jude, verse 3 says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation. Now, in 1 Peter chapter 1, he talks about the inspiration, how God, and we don't know exactly how he did it, but he was able to use these writers, use their personality, and use their wording to, to make what God's word is to say. It's God's word. In saying that, it looks like that Jude had an intention to write about another subject called our common salvation, which really was our lesson this morning from 2 Peter chapter 1. But then he said, it was more needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which is once for all delivered to the saints. This is a battle worth fighting, false doctrine earnestly fight for it, which was once for all delivered to the saints. We do not need, nor are we to have, any further revelation. So someone comes to your door and says, I have the King James Version, I have the Bible, but I also have another book. You don't need the other book. 
Or someone says to you, I know what the Bible says, but just stop right there. Whatever is going to come after that is man's opinion, which more likely is false teaching. Because if what the Bible says it, then that's, that's it. So tonight we're talking about the cause, false teaching. And now I want to talk about the culprits. The, the actual are false teachers, the attitude they have, and the agenda they have. First of all, there are actual false teachers, and they have been since the beginning. There are a lot of scriptures in the Old Testament I could use right here, but I want you to turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 18. Deuteronomy chapter 18. The last couple of verses here, 20 and 21, I want to look at specifically. Or actually, 222. But the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, small g, plural, even the prophet shall die. If thou say in thine heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord hath not spoken? When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, that thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken. But the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously. Thou shalt not be afraid of him. In the New Testament, I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 15. Matthew 7 and verse 15. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are rebelling wolves. Here is warning both Old and New Testament about false teachers. Now their attitude is quite um, depicted here. Let's go back to 2 Peter chapter 2 now and pick up at verse 1. Just read for our hearing. There were false prophets also among the people. We just talked about that. Even there shall be, there shall be false teachers among you who secretly shall bring in damnable heresies. You can see how God feels about them, but the heresies are false teaching, even translated sex, even denying the Lord that bought them. This, in this time frame, and we're going to see it in 1 John as well, there was a group of false teachers. They were called the Gnostics from the Greek word gnos, which means to know. And so you might say they were the know-it-alls. And they thought they knew it all. They knew more than the Bible. And so Peter, and especially John, writes to that effect by saying true knowledge versus this man-made knowledge. This man-made knowledge, for instance, the Gnostics, they taught false doctrine that when Jesus came to the earth, they said sin is in the flesh. So Christ couldn't come in the flesh. And so he came and he was a spirit type individual and the spirit left him it was came at his baptism and it left him before the crucifixion what does that do to the gospel he doesn't he's not born of flesh so he can't be our savior he didn't die on the cross he can't be our savior deny the lord that bought them that's what he's saying here and bring upon themselves swift destruction there are many false doctrines. We don't have time to go into all of them tonight. But just to give you a few of what we're facing today. For instance, probably the major one is that almost every other church I can think of does not believe that baptism is essential to salvation. And they teach that. You're saved by faith only. But how do you get around 1 Peter 3.21? Baptism doth also now save us. That's the Bible. That's what it says. There are others who say, once you're saved, you're always saved. That's not Bible. In 2 Peter chapter 2, we're going to see tonight, verses 20 through 22, he says, once you've escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of our Savior Jesus Christ and are again entangled therein, overcome, the latter end's worse than the beginning. It's not once saved, always saved. A vast majority of the denominational world believe in what's called the premillennial theory. 
the idea that Jesus is going to rapture, you've perhaps seen those bumper stickers, in case of rapture, this car will be vacated, take the righteous right out of the world and leave the unrighteous here for a thousand year reign upon the earth. By the way, it's been very popularized by these movie series called Left Behind. Those left behind, they say, will go through a thousand year tribulation period and then Christ is going to come again. That's not taught in Scripture. What is taught is 2 Peter chapter 3. When Christ comes again, it will be a final destruction. Everything will be dissolved and they have a new heaven, a new earth, a, a kingdom, a, a heaven, and also a hell in which Christ will have judgment day on that day. That's what the Bible teaches. There are those who teach that the church is not essential to our Christian lives. Now, when I was living in the 60s, the phrase was, give me the man, not the plan. Today is called nonners. They say, this generation of millennials say, that we are non-affiliated with any particular religion. We just believe in Jesus. We don't go to church. Well, again, how false can you get? In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 20 through 22, the Bible says that God gave Christ to be head over all things to his church, which is his body. How can you have the head without the body? I am the bridegroom, the church is the bride. How can you have a marriage without one or the other? I am the chief cornerstone, and the church is built upon me. How can you have a cornerstone without a building or a building without a cornerstone? So it's just ridiculous. But this is what goes on all around us. So among those doctors and many others, anything that's not Bible is false teaching. But notice how God feels about it here in verse 1, brought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious or destructive ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. What is so damning about this is, not only do they condemn themselves, but they get the new converts, they get the weak ones to follow them, and they also are condemned. And through covetousness, because they want the power, they want the prestige, they want the accolades, even money, shall they with feigned words, this is an interesting word, it comes from the Greek word plastos. Now what does that sound like to you? Plastic. Their words are plastic. You can twist plastic. So that's what he says in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 16. Peter says some of these people have taken Paul's writings and twisted it to their own destruction. Feigned words make merchandise. They make a living off of the people by teaching them what they want to hear. Whose judgment now for a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. I think it's interesting that Peter wrote that, slumbereth not. Who do we know has fell asleep three times? But Peter's learned his lesson. and says, don't you sleep on this. Now let's turn to Jude. I'll tell you what, stay here, here, 2 Peter chapter 2. Let's look at verses uh, 10 through 12. He begins to talk about their attitudes, and they are proud and they're disrespectful. But chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise governments or authority. And it, it just really, I, I'm sorry, it appalls me how this news media attacks our president. Now, you may not agree with his policies, but to show respect for the office. But disrespect for the president, disrespect for police officers, disrespect for principals, because there's disrespect for parents in the home. False teachers are like that. They disrespect authority. You can't tell me what to do. It's my way. They disrespect governments. Presumptuous are they. Self-willed, all about me. They're not afraid to speak evil of any dignitary, whatever authority it might be. Now, I mentioned that Jude is a divine commentary on 2 Peter. So look over here at Jude, verses 8 through 10 now. Likewise, also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignitaries. And here's an example. Yet Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, 
this not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke thee. Now, we have no idea what this is about. That's one of the questions I want to ask God when we get there about this incident here. But what we do have here is the example. He goes on to say, But these speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally as brute beasts and those things, they corrupt themselves. They are irrational. But notice in verse 9, even angels, which again in 2 Peter 2 says are stronger than men, do not try to refute the devil. He simply say, the Lord take care of this. Give it to the Lord. They also are immoral and deceptive. Look at chapter 2 and verse 14 of 2 Peter. Having eyes full of adultery, they cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls. Again, they're predators on the new and the weak. And heart they have exercised with covetousness, because again, they covet this position. Cursed children is what he calls them. Now we'll go back to Jude, verses 15 and through 19. To execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are murmurers, complainers, walking at their own lust, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. They flatter you to get to your advantage. But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. How they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lust. These be they who divide. They're division makers. They are worldly and they have not the Holy Spirit. So he doesn't pull any punches here. Again, we mentioned they were murmurers and complainers. Back at verse 11 of Jude, he makes this analogy. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. Now, what is the way of Cain? I did it my way. That's the way of Cain. Or they ran greedily after the error of Balaam. Again, for the money, they were greedy, and there, he was... Uh, profit for hire, or perish with the gainsaying of Korah. Who's Korah? Korah rebelled and actually led a rebellion against the leadership, against Moses and Aaron, and the earth swallowed them up. So we have examples of this kind of action. And they, again, they are scavengers and predators. Go back with me to chapter 2 and look again at verse 14. He says, beguiling unstable souls. How? Let's look now at verse 18. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, again, they're all mouth, they allure those through the lust of the flesh, using that as a bait, through much wantedness, license to sin, those that were clean escape from them who live in error. Now, these folks had already gotten out of that. They were saved. Now they've been brought back in to ungodliness and unsaved by these false teachers, like a lure, like a fisherman that reeled them on in. While they promise, this is the false teachers, them liberty. Listen, you follow me and you can do this, you can do that, freedom. They themselves are the servants of corruption. You see, they're already in bondage. All they can offer you really is bondage. What's the only thing that can offer you to be free? In John 8 and verse 32, you shall know the truth. What? And the truth shall make you free, not error. And the freedom is free to submit to the Christ. And you find your freedom. Otherwise, you think you do it my own way, you're in the bondage of the world and of sin and corruption. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same is brought into bondage. For if after they've escaped the pollutions of the world, through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein, overcome, the latter end is worse than the beginning. How can being lost be worse than being lost? Because now they know better and go through an eternal hell knowing what they missed. 
For if it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness, as they have known it to turn from the holy commandments delivered unto them. And then he gives this example. It's, it's really gross, but it makes the point. It shows you how he feels about this. But it happened unto them according to the true proverb. The dog who got all of that junk out of his system now goes back and puts it all back in again. Or the sow who finally got washed up goes right back into the mud puddle again. It's not one saved, always saved. And the danger is to go back into it again. So what is the agenda of false teachers? Go back to 2 Peter chapter 2 and look with me at verse 1 again. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who secretly shall bring damnable heresies. They secretly come in. Do you see that picture behind me? Do you see the wolf? It's not real easy. But they blend in. They come undetected. Look with me over at the book of Jude. He says the very same thing. Verse 4. For there are certain men crept in unaware, it says, or unnoticed, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Again, ungodly people turning the grace of God into lasciviousness, license to sin, and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, that's the bad news. Now we're going to have some examples of how this can go on, but how God will overcome and deliver the righteous. One example after another. Start at Jude verse 5 here. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterwards destroyed them that believe not. We don't know exactly the number of the people that left Egypt with Moses. Some guesstimate in the millions. Do you know how many of those people entered promised land over the age of 20? Joshua and Caleb. It's not once saved, always saved. And then look at uh, 2 Peter 2, 4. And we'll come back to Jude in a second here. But 2 Peter 2, 4. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to the Hadean world and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. Now, again, we don't know all about this scene, but we'd all turn to Jude for a little more information. And Jude, verse 6. And the angels, which kept not their first estate. Oh, that's what it was. Whatever it was, the angels were not satisfied in the position God had given them. So they rebelled. But left their own habitation, he hath reserved an everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of that great day. Are you ready for this? Even for angels, it's not once saved, always saved. Then look with me at 2 Peter 2, verses 6 through 9. 1 Peter 2, 6 through 9. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overflow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly. And delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them, in seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust until the day of judgment to be punished. That's what he's trying to say here. He can deliver the righteous, punish the wicked. And this man, Lot, lived in that city day after day and saw what was going on. I must tell you, when I first started preaching, I would read Romans 1 about homosexuality, and I'd say, how in the world could any country allow that to happen? And now we're living in it. We're like Lot right now. What are you going to do? Turn over here to the book of Jude. Look at verse 7. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication, sexual sin, and going after strange flesh, is what he calls it, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal life. Now you go back to 2 Peter chapter 2. 
And listen to what God says here again. He says in verse 7, And delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy manner of life of the wicked. That's what he called it, filthy. Dwelling among them and seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul daily with their unlawful deeds. But today to say that, you're accused of being a homophobic or accused of hate speech. That's the furthest from my mind. These folks are lost. These folks need the gospel. But not to be told they're okay, that's false teaching. The Bible is very clear on this. We need to help folks know the truth. The truth shall make you free. And then in uh, 2 Peter 2, 6 through 9, oh, I just read that. So let's go over to uh, the cure. How do we cure this situation? That's what I want to do now. And let's look at Jude, verse 20. Jude, verse 20. But you, beloved, those who are trying to live the right kind of life, build up yourselves in your most holy faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the Word of God. And so as we listen to God's Word and we try to build ourselves in God's Word, 1 John 5 and verse 4, and this is the victory that overcometh the world even our faith. So build yourself up in the most holy faith. He then says, pray in the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? As the Holy Spirit directs. How does the Holy Spirit direct us to pray? Example, Jesus. How did Jesus pray? Not my will, but thine be done. That's exactly the opposite of false teachers. Not your will, but mine be done. But this is what he says here. Third, keep yourselves in the love of God. Notice, build yourself up in the most holy faith. Faith. Pray in the Holy Spirit. Hope. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Love. Now, how do you keep yourself in the love of God? John 14 and verse 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. Stay in the truth. Stay in the word. Stay safe in him. And then wait or look for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Keep looking. Keep being watchful. Keep waiting. Keep being attentive. Christ is coming at any moment. Are we ready? And then he says, rescue the perishing. In James 5, verses 19 and 20, he talks about, brethren, if you see another brother or sister, stray away from the truth. If you turn them back, you save them, their souls, from death and cover a multitude of sins. This is what he says here in the book of Jude. And some have compassion making a difference. Now, again, some of these naive people that are pulled away, they're, they're, you're walking on eggshells, they're very tender, they're very, uh, you have to walk very carefully, but very carefully with kid gloves, you bring them back to the faith. And there are others who are just hard-headed. He said, grab them by the nap of their neck and pull them out of the fire, hating the garment that they're involved in. So what's he saying here? Love the sinner, hate the sin. That's what I'm saying tonight. Love the sinner, hate the sin. Now, he ends on a very beautiful note. We talked about this morning a little bit. But he is able. Now unto him that's able, that's God, to keep you from falling. With all that Lot had to go through. He was delivered from Sodom and Gomorrah. He was able to keep him from falling into that. When God looked down and saw the angels were rebelling, they, they were cast out. But he spared those righteous angels. When Noah, in his day, had this wicked generation around him, just like we have today, 
Noah was trying to preach righteousness. But they wouldn't listen to him. God did deliver his family in the ark, but he destroyed all those around him. God is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless. I saw this morning, what does that mean? That means that when you stand before God in judgment, if you've obeyed the gospel, you were baptized into Christ and into his blood, they wash it away your sins. And if you keep praying and keep living the Christian life, 1 John 1, 7 and 9, he keeps on washing away your sins. So you're faultless when you stand before God in judgment. To the presence of the glory with exceeding joy, enter in thou good and faithful servant, into the joy of your Lord. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Or so be it. When you listen to anybody teach or anybody preach or anybody share with you the word, listen carefully. Do they have a book and a chapter and a verse for what they're saying? If they don't, it's their opinion. As one man told me one time, one little boy's opinion is as good as another. And that's true. Neither one of them is word of God. Let me show you one more thing before we close tonight. He gives some marvelous metaphors about false teaching itself. Look at chapter 2 and verse 13 with me. And shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure to riot in the day of daytime. Spots they are and blemishes. Ladies, how do you feel when you have a spot on your dress? Am I right? When you go to the mirror, that's the only thing you see? Your eyes go right to that spot? 99% of the material is, is good, clean, pretty. But that spot ruined it all. That's what false teachers do. They ruin it all. There's spots in your love feast or in your assemblies. Then look with me at verse 17. These are wells without water. You ever gone to the well for water? That's why you go to the well, brother guy. I understand that. So you go to the well for water. What if there's no water there? It's terrible. Or clouds, farmers. You see the black bottoms are coming over your land. Oh, wonderful. And they keep on going. These are false teachers and teaching. They're empty. Look at the book of Jude now with me. The book of Jude. This is 12 and 13. These are spots in your feast again. Feeding themselves with, with fear. Clouds they are without water, carried with the winds. There are trees whose fruit withereth, without fruit, twice dead and plucked up. If you pluck up a tree, what hope do you have getting any fruit off of that anymore? Zero. Zero. Raging waves, and we at Myrtle Beach know all about this. When we have a storm, raging waves of the sea foaming out their own shame. What do you call it on the beach after a storm? Junk. Just try. Go on the beach after a storm. It's full of junk. It's from the bottom of that ocean. That's what false teachers offer you. Wandering stars. Now, how would you be a good Boy Scout trying to follow the North Star if it kept moving? That's what false teachers do. They keep moving, the target. So you can't never fixed on it. To whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. I hope that you have no taste in your mouth for false teaching. No taste in your mouth or even want to hear anything but book, chapter, and verse. No taste in your mouth for anything but the truth. Because if you do that, the truth will make you free. Tonight, if you've been listening to this lesson, you say, you know, I, I've been listening to the wrong people, the wrong thing. And I need the truth. That's all we try to preach here. The truth and nothing but the truth. If you're looking for that kind of church, we'd like to talk to you about your soul and how you need to be right with God. But if you're ready to be baptized tonight, you can come forward. We'll baptize you tonight to have your sins washed away. If you have not been following the truth since you were baptized, you've been pulled away by error, you can come forward tonight. We'll pray with you and for you. Because there's no other way but his. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man come to the Father 
but by me. Know the truth, buy the truth, and sell it not. Will you come?